Right, so now, what is germane load and how does it work in terms of cognitive load theory? So now let's start off with the word germane because it's a fantastic word. And actually it comes from the old Latin word german. And what that meant was to bud or to sprout. I think that's fantastic. It's something which is growing. It's something new which is growing and making sense. It's kind of burgeoning. And in terms of that, it also means in terms of today's terms, it means something which is relevant, right? So now you have something which is budding and sprouting in terms of meaning making, and it's relevant. It's actually working in terms of the thing that you're working on. You're making sense of something and that is growing something. And that's vital to the way that good teaching works. So let's take a look at the definition with that kind of baseline um, uh, kind of description of German and germane. Right? And what you're doing is you are using, the learner is using cognitive energy. So they engage, they're active, they're doing something. What are they doing? Well, they are generating, refining, and automating schemas. So by a schema, remember a schema is trying to make organized knowledge in a kind of like a, a way where different parts and different elements of knowledge are combined in a systematic way. So if you are doing germane kinds of work, what you're trying to do is you're trying to organize your knowledge in a systematic way. And the diagram really catches it beautifully. Take a look. Over here, you've got a situation where the person's trying to make links, right? Trying to get things organized in a systematic way. And the more you do that and the better you get at it, refine, and then eventually it becomes so practiced that it's automated, well, then that promotes learning. And that's a vital part of how we improve teaching and learning in the cognitive, in uh, technical and vocational education. Okay? So now, how do you increase germane load? How do you make sure that you're in a situation where it's actually getting better? Well, the key thing is you've got to work with learner effort. And that's absolutely vital, right? The learner's got to be engaged in this. You can't have a situation where the learners are involved. The learner can't be passive. It's an active role of the learner and the student, and that's vital to the whole story. If you don't have the learner being active, well, you're not going to have germane load. And the second key thing over here is, is that, sorry, I just want to get the, uh, uh, the right color over here. The second key thing is that you want the learner to have metacognition. You want them to be able to think about how they're thinking. They've got to take control of their own process and engage with how they're learning and how they're thinking so that they're actively making sense. Now, you can decrease germane load, and that's a bad thing, right? You're taking away from the learner's ability to make sense of it. And the way they say that it works is it's when your working memory is being taken up by other subtypes of cognitive load. And specifically over here, the one which is being taken up by is if your extraneous load, sorry, extra aneous load <laughs> uh, is uh, too heavy. That's all the extra things that you're adding on to the lesson or the fact that the way you've designed the lesson is very bad and it's not adding and helping the student to understand what's going on. So the heavier that is, the more you're taking away from their meaning making. And sometimes what can happen is the intrinsic load, the actual subject itself, the actual topic is too hard for the learner. And what's happening is that's making them struggle as well. So that's the way you can decrease the germane load level. And obviously what can happen is the learner has an active role here. The more active they are and the more they are making sure that they are concentrating and focusing on it and their own working memory capacity is there, the better for them. So how do you promote it? Well, you can see over here what you've got to do is in terms of promoting, you ask the learners for self-explanation. You say, why are you doing this? Try and explain to me what's going on. And once they get a handle on it, you then vary things up. You start to use random rather than block practice. In other words, rather than just constructing it so that everything's laid out for them, you start to open it up and give them problems to solve. And that enables them to think about stuff. Right, so there we have the explanation. Most of you can go off now, but if you want to watch my own example to, to show how this works, you can laugh at me trying to answer uh, a baseline um, a question about uh, uh, 
how three angles of a triangle make up 180 degrees and how that works when a circle meets a friggin' tangent, right? So now initially when I looked at this and I tried to make sense of it, what happened was I could just use this example over here because it helped me out. And this is the way that I worked it. I looked at it and I was like, okay, you've got point O and I was able to go point O. It's the center of a circle, right? So I found it. And then it said AB is a tangent to the circle. Now I'd forgotten what a tangent was, so I had to look it up. And basically I started to find out that there's a tangent radius property. And the tangent radius property is basically wherever a radius hits the point, and if a line, straight line, touches at exactly that point, you've got a 90 degree angle. Okay, so I had to make sense of that. Now that I've made sense of it again, I'm not going to forget it. But over here, what they're doing is they're actually showing it for you. And they're saying, look, here it is. They're filling in the, the um, elements for you. They're blocking it out. They're saying what it is. So I go, okay, we know that that is 90 degrees. All right, so I've got that. And then they say AOB is 58 degrees. Where's AOB? Where's AOB? AOB. Oh, this one over here. Okay, and that is 58 degrees. So I got that as well. And now they want to know, what is this one over here? Right? And then they tell me. They go 32 degrees. Why? Because the sum of angles of a triangle equals 180 degrees. And we know we've got the 90. And we know we've got the 58. So what's left over? Well, 32 degrees. And that makes it 32 degrees. Now, that's a completely structured instance of it. Now, what you could do as a lecturer teaching in this area or as a teacher is you could then vary it. You could then give the students other examples which don't have all this information. So you could do a different one where you constructed it again and you were like, okay, let's, let's do it. So we've got this radius over here. We've got a tangent over there, right? And let's do this one over here. And now you can ask them, well, they know this is 90 degrees. I know that right? Uh, and you could either give them this angle or that angle and then ask them to work out what the other one is. So for example, you could say that um, this angle over here is uh, 30, 30 degrees, let's say, and then you could ask them, what's this one? Well, we know it must be 60. And now what you're doing is you're getting the learner to make sense of it. So there's the situation where you start to work with trying to ensure that your main load happens firstly by making sure that you give them enough information for them to make sense of it and to start the process. And then slowly but surely what you do is you take away that information and you start to give them another example which is harder and makes them think because it's different to the one which you've worked with with different examples and different information but still using some of the basic information which they've learnt.